Streamið er komið að stað og the stream is on og klukkan er alveg að verða þrjú við hingurum aðeins þá út klukkan er þrjú As when we get confirmation that the stream is on, then I will start the meeting. And the meeting uh, can start because the stream is on. Stream is on, and we're all in picture. Good day, Atsumul. And welcome to the afternoon's work, Empathis Landlagnis, and the winner of the Rikisins. Eysteinn Eyjálsson heiti ég og ég er verkefnistjóri hjá Virk, starfsendur og hæðingarsjóði og ég ætla að halda utan um hennan fund. Fundurinn er sá fimmti í fundaröð sem að við höfum haldið um heilsöflingu á vinnustöðum og er hluti af heilsu, eflingu á vinnustöðum átaki eða samstarfi sem að stofnanir þrjá standa af. Markmið samstarfsins er að stöðla betri heilsu og velja hann vinnandi fólks á vinnustöðum, fyrirbyggja kölnun og minka brottfall á vinnumarkaði. Þessi fund er átt að vera hefðbundin morgunfundur eins og fyrri fjóru funditni sem við heldum, en heimsvaraldurinn sem að við þekkjum öll og vitum hver staðan er á, setti strikið reikningin hjá okkur eins og fleirum, og Kristina Maslak komst ekki til okkar á allan morgunfund. En við vonumst til þess að hún sæki okkur heim að ári, og við getum þá haldið morgunfund um þetta verðu á mikið að efni. En þó svo við náðum ekki að halda venjulega morgunfund, þá vildu við halda fundun til streitu, en það máli þart og umræðan brýn og Kristína og Linda Bára voru svo almennilega að slá til og taka þátt í þessum eftirmyndasfundi. Kristína tala frá San Francisco, það sem klukkan er rúmlega átta á mótni og Linda Bára hér hann og Guðrúntúni og hér er klukkan þrjú eða eftir mitt dæm og falla eftir öður. Það verðist við líka að vera gott öður í San Francisco, hitta, bylgja og gott öður báðumstöðum. Fundinum er strengt á vefsíum virk, embættis landlagnis og vinnu eftirlitsins og áhörundum mun gefast tækifæri á að sendi spurningar til framsögumanna í tölvupósti á ingibjörg ell at virk.is. Ég ber svo spurningarna fram eftir framsögu þeirra í lokfundar. En það er ekki eftir neinu að býða. Við erum klár í slægin og fyrri framsögumaðurinn er kollegi minn, Linda Bára Líðsdóttir, doktor í sálfræði og sviðstjóri hjá Virk. Ég veit þið þín, Linda Bára, gjörðu svo vel. Takk. Er. Smá tæknilega aðstóð hérna hjá mér en ég held að ég sé komin í loftið, þið heyrið í mér og glærunar eru komnar upp, kinkað kollegisteinni það er rétt hjá mér Þá hérna þakka ég bara fyrir mig og hérna við byrja á að segja hvað það er gaman að fá að vera hérna og tala svona út í loftið til líkar, ég vona þið séð þarna einhver staðar í kosmónu Ég veit að Kristína er þarna og það er mér mikill heiður að fá að vera upphyttunabandið fyrir Kristínu. Ég hef fylst með henni sem fræðimann frá 1997-1996 en hún er, já, ég hugsa að hún sé nú stæðsta nafnið á sviði kunnunar sem að hefur komið og er eins og staðan er í dag. Nú eins og framkom í hérna kynningunni hjá Eistinni Þá er ég sviðstjóri hjá Virk. Virk er starfsendurhæfingar sjóður sem að aðstóra fólk sem hefur dottað að vinnu markanum vegna heilsubrest. Við erum með yfir 50 hérna ráðgjafa sem að vinna um allt land við það að sinna einstaklingum sem til okkar leita og hjálpa þeim til að finna úrræði og hvernig þeir geta komist aftur að vinnu markaðinn. Og við höfum síðastlinn ár verið að haft mikinn áhuga á kvölnun og það er nú alveg ástæða fyrir því og hún er svo að fyrir nokkrum ári síðan þá hérna þá fórum við að finna fyrir 
bæði meiri áhuga og almennari umræðu um kulnun en líka fóru rákja var að koma til okkar og, og, og segja við okkur að það væri eitthvað í gangi þann úti. Það hérna, væri fleiri og fleiri að koma inn sem sögðust hafa fundið fyrir kulnun í starfi og, og þeir, þetta væri að svona, þeir hefðu á tilfinninguna þetta væri að verða stærra vandamál. Þannig að við fórum að skoða þetta hjá virk og höfum verið að skoða þetta síðan. Um, við vildum náttúrulega fá að vita hversu algengt kulnun, kulnun væri á Íslandi og fórum að skoða gögnin okkar. Og hérna, og því sjáum hérna er ég með tölur uh, hvaða heilsubrestir eru til staðar hjá þeim sem hafa leitað til okkar 2019 og 2020. Það þarf að vera staðfestur heilsubrestur til þess að einstaklingar geti komið í þjónustu hjá okkur. Og ef við skoðum þessa myndir þá sjáum við að um 60% þeirra sem eru hjá okkur eru að kljást við gæðraskanir. Af þeim eru cirka 25% að kljást við lindisraskanir eða þunglindi og kvíða. En 57% er að, er að kljást við svona ja, streitutengda raskanir, gæðraskanir. Það er um kringum 40% sem eru að kljást við stóðkerfisraskanir uh, en mun færri sem eru að kljást við líkamlega sjúkdóma og taugasjúkdóma. En við sjáum líka hér að hér eru engar tölur uh, til staðar um kulnun og þið veldið því eflust fyrir okkur af hverju ekki. Jú, það er mjög einfalt. Þannig er nú málið að, og þegar aðeins að færa myndinar því að það eru akkur til að fyrir, að við hér á Íslandi, við stýðjust við flokkunakerfi sem heitir ICD-10. Þetta flokkunakerfi auðveldar okkur að finna út hvað er það sem er að hrjá einstaklingin hvaða sjúkdómar er einstaklingur að kljást við. Og í þessu kerfi sem við notum hér á Íslandi og, og er notað í Evrópu, þar er kulnun ekki skilgreitt sem sjúkdómur, heldur ástand. Þetta er ástand sem flokkast undir vandamál sem tengjast erfileikum við að stjórna lífi sínu og kallast lífsþreytu ástand. Þar sem þetta er ekki heilsubrestur eða sjúkdómur, þá kemur þetta ekki fram í beðinum sem við fáum til okkar. Og þar leiðandi getum við ekki sagt til um það út frá greiningum hve margir af þeim sem leita til okkar er að kljást við kulnu. Nú það sem við gerum er að við spyrjum þá sem komið þjónstu til okkar. Hvað telja þeir að annað geti haft áhrif á starfskittu þeirra? Sem sagt annað en heilsuprestur. Og við nefnum margar aðstæður, á, ástæður. Meðal annars hérna, fjárhag, einelti, meðfallan heilsuprest, áfall og kulnu. Og við sjáum hér á þessari mynd að af þeim sem að svara að annað en heilsubrestur getur haft áhrif á starfsgetu, þá eru það um 30% sem segja að það sé kulnum. Það er, að, það er engöngu áfall sem er með svipað svar hlutfall, aðrar ástæður eru mun lærri. Þetta, þessi prósent er bara svona til að halda því til haga. Þetta segir okkur ekkert til um algengi kulnunar hjá þeim sem eru hjá virk. Þetta er eigið mat. Við vitum það að það er ekki allir sem telja sig vera með kulnun sem eru með kulnun í raun og veru. Um, það er svona smá ruglingur á þessu, ekki bara hjá okkur, hjá virkeldu líka hjá einstaklingum, hvað er kulnun. En þetta er samt það háa tölur að við svona teljum þetta að vera áhugefni og eins og ég segi, við höfum verið síðslega ára að kalla á meiri umræðu um kulnun á Íslandi. En til að svara þeirri spurningu hver staðan er varðandi kulnun á Íslandi, þá er það nú bara þessi. Við vitum í raun ekkert um algengi kulnunar á Íslandi. Það eru til rannsóknir, nemarannsóknir sem hægt er að finna á skemmunni eh, á netinu, þar sem verið er að skoða algengi kulnunar hjá hinum og þessu starfstjættum. Þar er stuðst við matstæki sem hafa verið þýtt, eh, erlend matstæki sem eiga að meta kulnun. Eh, þau hafa engöngu verið þýtt þau hafa ekki hérna, verið prófræðilega skoðu þannig að við getum ekkert alhæft út frá þeim rannsóknum því miður. Þannig að við sitjum uppi með þetta, við vitum raun og vera ekkert um algengi kulnun á Íslandi. Við erum ennþá að reyna að kljást við það hvað kulnun er í raun og veru. Þannig að ég skil vel að þið séð ruglið yfir þessu því að við höfum verið það svo sannarlega líka. Hvernig eigum að nálgast þetta fyrirbæri kulnun? Nú, ég ætla sem sagt að nota þennan uh, tíma sem ég hef til að segja ykkur þá aðeins frá fyrirbærinu kulnun og reyna að útskýra hvað það er. Þetta er flókið fyrirbæri. 
við höfum hinga til ekki verið alveg með að hreinu hvað það er. Erum við að tala um eitthvað sjúkdóm? Nei, samkvæmt greiningakerfinu sem við notum, þá er þetta ekki sjúkdómur. Hvað er þetta þá? Nú, það er ekki bara við á Íslandi sem höfum verið að strakla við þetta. Önnur land hafa líka verið að veldu sér fyrir sér, þó að sum lönd séu lengra komin í sínum pælingum heldur en önnur. Ef við skoðum á Google skólar hversu marga rannsóknir hafa verið gerðar, á burnout eða kvölnun þá sjáum við í kringur 780.000 byrtingar og þá er ég að tala um byrtingar á faggreinum. Þegar ég fer í minn gagnagrunn sem er sálfræð gagnagrunn og skoða hversu margar vísindagreinar finn ég þar þar sem við erum að skoða burnout eða kvölnun þá er þar í kringur 12.000 rannsóknir. Þannig að þetta er alveg gríðalegur fjöldi sem hefur byrst af rannsóknum sem er alveg svolítið furðulegt í ljósi þess að Við erum ekki ennþá eða vorum ekki ennþá komin á þann stað að geta átt okkur ráði hvað kvölnun væri, hvað er burnout. Ég hef lengi notast við þessa skilgreiningu. Kvölnun er alvarlegt langtíma neikvætt ástand hjá einstaklingum sem er tilkomið vegna viðverandi streitu. Þetta er mjög opin skilgreining. Þetta er eitthvað neikvætt ástand, hvað er það og hvað er viðverandi streita. Þetta er ekki beint tengt vinnu samkvæmt þessar skilgreiningu. Og margir hafa spurst sig að því hvort að kvöldu sé þá ekki bara sama og hérna þungleiti. Og það eru bara nýlegar hérna greina sem hafa verið að byrtast þar sem við verið að segja að kvöldun er ekkert nema þungleiti. En við teljum að svo sé ekki. Það eru til rannsóknir sem sína fram á að það er hægt að gera greina minn á milli þungleitis og kvöldunar. Vissulega geta þeir einstaklingar sem að er að kljást við kvöldun fundi fyrir þungleiti. Þungleiti getur verið afleiðing eins og þungleiti oft er. En rannsun hafa sýnt fram á það að þegar við reynum að vinna buga einkennu þunglitis hjá einstaklingu sem hafa kvölnað í starfi og við náum að draga úr einkennu þunglitis þá eru önnur einkennu endi staðar, einkennu kvölnunar endi staðar þó að einstaklingu sér lengi þunglitur. Sem segir okkur það að kvölnun og þunglitið þetta er sikkurt fyrirbæri. Nú, en hver eru þá einkenni kvölnunar? Jú, það er nú hún Kristína sem að hérna er með okkur í dag sem að kom með þessi þrjú einkenni sem að mest er horft til og það er örmögnun eða þessi svona óeðlil og hamlandi þreyta einstaklingur fer í þrót bæði líkamlega og tilfinningalega hann hefur líta að bjóða öðrum en það er ekki nóg, það er líka það sem við tölum um að sé svona andlega, einstaklingur er andlega fjarverandi vinnu og það eru neikvæð viðþorf eða tortryggni sem eru tengd vinnustaðnum og beinast að vinnustaðnum sjálfum og jafnvel af samstarfsfjölum. Einstaklingar þeir líka aftengjast vinnustaðnum, þeir aftengjast sínum samstarfsfjölugum og þeir einangrast sem er að kljást við kvölnu. Og síðan er það þriðja enginn og það er dvínandi persónlegur árangur. Neikvætt mat á eigin getu, erfileikar til að takast á við vandamál, slakur árangur og minni afköst. Ég ætla svo sem ekkert að eyða miklu tími þetta en ég vil sem benda það að Kristíni segir að til þess að geta sagt að einstaklingur sé með kvölnun þá þarf hann að tykka hátt á öllum þessum einkennum. Það sem hefur aftur móti verið að gerast er að aðtiklin hefur verið að beinast mikið að örmögnun hjá öðrum fræðimönnum, hjá heilbriðistarfstjöttum, hjá löndum og margir vilja meina að þetta sé einkenni kvölnunar, það er örmögnunin. En Kristína vill meina svo sé ekki, ef við erum bara að fókusa á örmögnu þá er það mikið miss að horfa ekki á hinn tvö einkennin og vill meina að við þurfum að skoða þau öll saman. En eins og ég segi, hún mun væntalega fara betur yfir þetta með ykkur á eftir. Nú, en örmögninni er það sem að hefur verið svona gegnum gangandi til staðar en Ef við skoðum söguna með kvölnun þá sjáum við að börnat er svo sem ekkert nýtt fyrirbæri og það hafa verið getgátur um það að Móses okkar í Biblíunni hann hafi jafnvel brunnið út þegar hann var að leiða hérna þjóðflokksinn í gegnum hremmingarnar. Hann gaf og gaf af sér og var sífelt að reyna að leysa vandamál eftir vandamál á meðan fekk hann ekkert nema að leiðindi til baka Það er talað um að hann hafi orðið svona fyrir miklum vonbröðum og jafnvel orðið neikvæður gagvast sínu fólki. Nú, ég ætla svo sem ekkert að tjá mig meir um það. En 1869 þá kemur fram á sjónarsvið nýtegunda geðröskun sem er kölluð neurasthenia 
og hefur fengið það skemmtilega heiti kvellislegja hér á Íslandi. En við notum líka orðið taugakvilli, með hans bara kvellislegja skemmtilega. Nú, þetta er sem sagt, kom fram í bandaríkjunum, þessi geðröskun og hún er ennþá til sem greining. Einkinnin voru sjúkli þreyta eða örmögnun, andlega og líkamleg, þunglindis og kvíða einkinni og líkamleg einkinni. Nú, þessi geðröskun, hún var talin vera afleiðing yðnvæingar sem var á þessum tíma. Símar voru að koma, rafkrúni, farskjótar, dagblöð, þannig að það var mikið svona rafræn áreiti sem var dundi á fólki. Og við svo sem könnust alveg við þetta í dag, svona sambærilega stöðu nema við erum komin aðskrifinu lengri í dag. En svona gaman að veldu sér fyrir sér hvað er sambærilega við þennan tíma í kringum 1869 og tíman okkar í dag var þetta tækni. En hún var algengust í að kartmönnum sem sintu viðskiptum. Og það hefur verið bent á það að njúrstíðanýja og hérna kulnun sé mjög sambærilegt. En þetta er sem sagt geðröskun, þetta er sjúkdómur, þetta er geðsjúkdómur. Það eru löndið þá þetta í dag sem er að nota þessa greiningu þegar þeir eru að meta kulnun. Nú, síðan gerist það 1974 að það er Herbert Freutenberger, klínisku sálfræðingur, hann er sjálfur hérna meðferða aðli fyrir vímöfna neytundir í New York og hann fyrir að finna sjálfur fyrir þessar örmögnum, tilfyrningaleg örmögnum, líkamlega örmögnum og fyrir að skorta áhugabæta á því sem hann hafði haft mikinn áhuga og mikið svona hugsjón fyrir og hann sér þetta líka hjá sínum kollegum. Og mikil vinna í langa tíma, árangur stripni, gefa af sér án þess að fá umbund, takmörg á skoðum vinnu, taldi hann vera ástæða fyrir þessu. 1997 kemur síðan Kristína Maslag fram á sjónarsviðið með þeir trúð það bátt börnát. Og hérna, nú hlustar hún og heyri bara nafni sitt og veit að við erum eitthvað að ræða hana. En þetta voru tímamóta verk, sem sagt, þetta voru svona tímamót á sviði kölnuna. Og hún talar um þessi þrjú enginni sem ég er búin að nefna við ykkur. Og hún tengir þetta við vinnustaðan. Sem sagt, þetta er vinnutengt álag, skortur og stjórna í náðstaðum, skortur og umbun, traustin, traustið, stuðningi, sangirni frá starfsumhverfi og starfið hefur ekki lengur jákvæða merkingu. Hún þróaði þarna Maslag Burnout Inventory sem er sá spurningalist sem er mest notaður í dag, þetta er rannsóknatæki, þetta er endar ekki klínistæki. En það sem að Herbert og Kristína eru sammála um að þetta er ekki læknisfræðilegt fyrirbæri, þetta er ekki sjúkdómur, heldur er þetta eðlileg viðbrug við óeðlum vinnutengdum aðstæðum. Nú á þessum tíma var ég sjálf að læra út í Hollandi og útskrifast þar 1999 og þetta var mikið í umræðinu í Hollandi. Hollandingar eru frekar framalega á mörgu sviðum. Ég lærði klíniska sálfræði. Það var ekkert minnst á kulnun í mínu námi. Ég lærði allt um geðraskanir en ekkert um kulnun og því kulnun var ekki talið vera geðraskur. Maður minn var aftur að móta að læra vinnusálfræði í sama landi. Og hann lærði allt um kulnun og það var í gegnum hann sem ég fór að fylgjast með kulnun og fór að fá áhuga á kulnun. Þannig að það segir svolítið sitt um hvernig kulnun og fyrirbæri, hvernig nálgunin var á því á þessum tíma. Þetta var sem sagt ekki sjúkdómur. Aftur á móti þá gerist það í Hollandi 2000 nokkrum ára setna að þeir samt ákveða að sitja vægja á þetta og þeir gefa út klíniska leiðbyrningar sem meta og meðfundla streitu tengda sjúkdóma tengda vinnastöðum, þarna fara þeir í því að skilgreina burnout sem geðið röskun. Þeir tala um þrjú stig streitu, það er frekar væg streitu enginni sem geta leitt í skerðingar og vinnu framlægi, það eru alvarleg streitu enginni og þá fylgir því tímabundi fjarvera frá vinnu. Við erum að sjá tölvert mikið fjölda þar hjá okkur hjá virk sem eru í þessu svona miðjustíi, en aftur á móti þá er það þriðja stíð sem Hollendingar benda á sem er burnout og þeir nota greininguna njórustenía, hvellisleikju eða vinnutenga taugakvilla. Og þetta er þá orðin geðröskun og þetta er mjög alvarlegt ástand, langtíma fjarvara frá vinnu. Þeir tala um alltaf tveggja ára hérna veikindaleifi vegna kulnunar. 2005 koma síðan svíjar með skilgreiningu á hérna kulnun og þeir ganga skrefinu lengra og segja að kulnun er geðröskun. Þeir nota aðra greiningu heldur en hollendingar og þeir fókusa á örmögnun. Og þeir eru ekki að blanda vinnustanum í þetta og þarna fer að koma inn í umræðina að kulnun sé eitthvað sem er tengt bara streitu aðstæðum almennt. 
Þeir eru framalega í rannsóknum og þeir benda á að það er örmögnum sem er til staðar hjá þessu fólki. Vitrana truflanir, minnist truflanir, skert einbytting og það má alveg nefna það að rannsóknir hafa sýnt að hjá þeim einstaklingu sem telja sig að hafa náð einhverju bata hvað varða kulnun, þá eru vitrana truflanir ennþá til staðar mörgum árum setna. Nú það er lækkað álafsþól, það er pyrringur, það er svefntruflanir, það er truflandi líkamlega einkenni eins og stóðgerðsverkir, meldingatruflanir og fleira. Við sitjum svolítið uppi með þessar nálganir, þessar þrjá nálganir sem ég er búin að benda okkur á núna og það er, erum við að tala um að kvölnum sé geðröskun eða er þetta eðlileg viðbröð við óeðlum aðstæðum í vinnu. Bandaríkjamenn, þeir hafa ekki farið í það að tala um þetta sér greiningu, þeir telja þetta að vera vinnutengt. Aftur á móti hér í Evrópu, sérstaklega í Norður-Evrópu, þá er þetta svolítið flóknara einfalt út af því að við erum með almenna tryggingakerfi sem að hlúir að fólki, við erum með fjárslega bætur, en til þess að geta fengið aðstóð þá þarf að hafa oft læknisfræðilega greininga og ég tel að það hafi náttúrulega haft einhver áhrif á það að svíjar og hollendingar fara þá leið að skilgreina þetta sem sjúkdóm. En skiptir þetta máli? Er þetta ekki bara einhver vitlisa í mér, einhver fámanni að vera að rífast um það eða að vera að velta því fyrir mér, erum við að tala um sjúkdóm eða erum við að tala um eðlileg viðbröð við óelum aðstæðum í vinnu? Jú, þetta er skiptir nefnilega miklu máli, því að spurningin er alltaf hvað get ég gert, hvað getum við gert hjá við til þess að aðstofa fólk sem kemur til okkar með kunnun. Ef við förum á netið þá sjáum við að það er ímislegt staðar, við getum 20 söngva sem eða að koma okkur í gegnum kunnun. Draumurinn er náttúrulega alltaf lif, það væri náttúrulega hið ítjál fyrir marga. Nú, sumafríið, það svo sem hefur alltaf verið til staðar um að vera með svona smá hérna rítsjarts okkur. En bottolænið er að við hjá virk höfum farið aðeins vandari leiðir, heldur en ég er að benda ykkur á hérna. Við höfum verið að bjóða upp á hugrana aðfallismeðferð, slökun, jóga, mindfulness og fleira. Og við sjáum vissulega árangur, við sjáum að einkenni það dregur úr einkennum. En það sem við sjáum jafnframt er að þegar þessir einstaklingar sem eru búin að vera hjá okkur og telja sig vera búin að vinna bug á sínum, fara aftur í sína stöðu að í sér starf, þá líður ekki löngu þangað til þeir veikjast aftur og þeir detta aftur úr starfi. Eða þá, það sem við sjáum líka er að einstaklingar sem að koma til okkar vegna kunnun, þeir ná einhverjum bata, einhverjum framförum, þeir ákveða að þeir ætla ekki að snúa tilbaka í sitt starf, fyrra starf. Er það ekki allt í lægi? Jú, en það er samt mikil skað í því. Því að við sjáum að þetta er oft einstaklingar sem hafa menntað sig, þeir hafa mikla reynslu, þeir hafa mikla þekkingu, þeir tilheyra stjættum þar sem að töluverð fjöldi einstaklinga er að falla frá vegna kunnunar. Þannig að við erum að missa reynslu og þekkingu úr starfstjættum í dag. Heilbriðstjættir, kennarstjættir og fleira. Og þess vegna teljum við að þetta sé mjög mikilvægt. Okkar okkar úrræði sem við bjóðum þau sem sagt þau hafa takmörkuð áhrif og ástæðan fyrir því er að þegar einstaklingurinn kemur aftur í sitt fyrra umhverfi sem er vinnustaðarinn þá bara fyrir hann upp aftur sem að segir okkur það að Kristíne hefur eitthvað til síns máls þetta er tengt vinnustaðanum Nú þarna vorum við, við vorum staðsett þarna þessu tíma, fyrir ári síðan vorum við staðsett þarna og veldum fyrir okkur hvað er í gangi. Eigu að fara á geðrúskunnleiðina, eigu að sjúkdómsvæða kunnun eða eigu að fara að kristínuleið. Þá fara berast fregnir erlendis frá og við fáum að sjá í fjölmiðlum að alþjóð heilbrúðstofnunin, hún sem sagt gefur það út samkvæmt erlendu fjölmiðlum að nú sé þeir búin að taka ákvörðun, kunnun er sjúkdómur. Og við erum svo bara, ok, flott, það er búið að leysa þetta vandamál. Við berum að skoða og sjá okkur akkur breyttu þeir um skoðun, því að ef þið munið það rétt, þá var kölnun sem sagt ástand en ekki sjúkdómur. Og þá kemur það ljós að þetta er bara allt bull og vitlisa. Fjölmiðlar þeir tóku bara vitlist eftir. Og alþjóð heilbrustofnun gefur út í maí 2019 frétta tilkynningu sem segir að kölnun samkvæmt þeim er hvorki líkamlegar nýja andlega sjúkdómur heldur er ástanda ræða sem er afleiðing langvarandi streit á vinnustað sem hefur ekki tekist á árangur ríkan hátt að ná stjórn á. Kulnun vísa til fyrirbæris í tengslu við vinnumhverfið og ætti ekki vera nýtt til að lýsa reynslu á öðru sviðin lífsins. Sem sagt, 
Þetta er ekki sjúkdómur og þetta tengist vinnumhverfinu, þetta tengist ekki öðrum aðstæðum. Eh, af hverju var alltaf heilbrigðisstofnun að koma út með þetta 2019? Jú, þeir voru að endurútgefa í sitt 10 greiningakerfi. Það heitir í sitt 11 í dag. Við erum ekki búin að innleiða það hér á Íslandi, en það mun líklega vera gert á næstu árum. Og þá munum við væntanlega fara eftir þessum leiðbeiningum. Þetta er náttúrulega ótrúleg viðkenning á störfum Kristína Marslaf. Því að þeir segja og er að skoða rannsóknir alltaf á heitbjörstofninni að þeir eru að fara bara nákvæmlega þessum hún er búin að vera að segja öll þess ár. En það er hún einn af okkur helstu fræðimar á þessu sviði og það verður svolítið gaman að heyri í henni á eftir hvað hún ætlar að segja okkur um hvað vinnum hvað er getur gert. En aðeins áðan er ég lík máli mínu því að það er komið að lokum hjá mér að þá langar maður þess að bara svona rétta innra á því hver staðan á Íslandi er eftir fyrstu bylgja COVID-19 því að það er náttúrulega við sitjum hér nú í sikkur og horni við, erum ekki, við stöndum ekki frammi fyrir fullum svala að, að hérna fólki ég veit ekki eins og hvort einhver hefur að hlusta mig annar en Kristín og Eysteinn en COVID-19 hefur dunið á okkur uh, við höfum töluverðar áhyggjur uh, að því hvaða áhrif COVID-19 uh, myndu hafa á okkar heilsufar og, og líða uh, í gær þá kemur Alma með uh, fyrstu nýðustur úr könnun sem landlagni stendur að það sem að fram kemur að líðan Íslendinga í mars og apríl er að öllu jafnum góð. Uh, flesti finna fyrir jákvæm áfram, fleiri með að andlega heilsu sína góð eða mjög góða og færri upplega streit í daglegu lífi. Þann er hún náttúrulega ekki að tala um þá sem eiga erfitt fyrir eða standa fram fyrir atvinnuleysi. Hún er að tala um svona almennt að jafnaði. En það sem að við höfum áhyggjur að, það eru þessar stjættir sem við höfum áhyggjur að fyrir COVID-19. Það er þessar þjónustugreinar, heilbyðistarsvar, kennara, fólk í þjónustugreinum. Þetta er fólk í það sem við vorum farin að sjá að kunnum var farin að tykka svolítið sterkt inn. Nú hafa þeir staðið vaktina fyrir okkur, þeir eru búin að vera hérna algjörlega undir miklu álagi, þeir hafa staðið sig frábærlega. Ég hef fulla trúa því að starfstaðir þessara þessara hérna, stétta, þeir munu standa sig vel og þeir munu reyna að gera hvað þeir geta til að hlúa vel að þessu fólki. En ég vona líka að þeir hlusti á hvað Kristína hefur að segja því að hún er að koma með þetta innbúð núna í sínu fyrirlistri og það er hvað geta starfstaðir gert til að draga úr líkum á kunnun hjá sínu heilbriðs eða bara almennu starfsfólki og annað enn að sitja smót í tektur á hausinn að því. Þannig að ég segi bara orðið til þín, Kristína, og við hlökkum mjög mikið til. Takk fyrir mig. Takk fyrir Linda Bára. Ég minni á að áhörundur geta sendið spurningar til framsögumanna í tölvusta á Ingibjörg L. Atvirk.ris og svo berjið spurningarnar hérna til þeirra. Setni framsögumarinn í dag er dóttur Kristína Mastlag, sálfræðingur og prófessor í sálfræði við Berkli Háskóla í Galvorníu. Hún hefur unnið að rannsóknum í ymsum sviðum innan félags- og heilsusálfræði en er þekktust fyrir að brautriðandi rannsóknum á vinnutengdri gulnum eins og Linda Bára fór yfir á það meðal annars. Mastlag hefur skrifað fjölmarga greinar og bækur um gulnun og hlóti ymsar viðkenningar við starf sín og ég má til með að benda að það er grein sem að eftir Marslag sem við þýttum sem er í nýjasta ársriti virk sem er á vefnum og verður prenta fljótlega So, hello Kristína and thank you for joining us from California I wish I were with you actually in Iceland but this will have to do for now Yeah, the floor is yours Okay Okay Okay, so can we see that? Is that oh, wonderful? Excellent. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to everyone who was part of this um, uh, conference. I am sorry I can't be there in person. I would really be looking forward to it. But what I want to do is share with you some things that we have learned uh, about burnout that we think might be helpful as we move into essentially a new era of rethinking and reinventing what workplaces uh, are going to be like, uh, because it's clearly going to have to change in the wake of the 
COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> ah. So basically, what is happening now is a major disruption and change in the world of work as a result of the pandemic. Uh, so we now learn that it's, we can't really work too close to other people. That's going to have to change uh, the way offices and assembly lines and everything are, are working. What we're finding and learning is that long hours uh, within an enclosed space uh, actually puts you at more risk. Uh, so it's not just being too close, but it's being too close for a long time without good ventilation. Uh, the kind of surfaces that are in the, the tables, the chairs, the whatever, the rugs, etc., may be harder to clean and keep on track of, and that may change, again, what we use. Uh, difficulties for people to regularly wash their hands, which is a clear thing that we need to do uh, in terms of any kind of virus like this. And there are other things as well. But just to say that some of the things that we've been thinking about in the workplace are now joined by another set of um, precautions, uh, demands that are needed in order to make the workplace safe. And if we're going to have any kind of economic recovery, we really have to have a healthy workplace. And we've known that before, but now it's even more so. So that really trying to think how we make this better uh, is going to be critical for us going, uh, going forward. Now, healthy workplaces are not something new. There's a lot that we've learned and we already know about them. Um, we know that, uh, for example, various job conditions are highly stressful and toxic uh, in terms of our health and well being. And there is an enormous amount of research literature uh, to support this. So we know this long working hours, high demands where you have much to do and not enough resources, time, materials, you know, anything that you need to do it. Uh, insecurity about your job, whether you keep it, uh, the lack of control you might have over what you do, uh, low social support, uh, difficulties in managing both work and family life. And there are other factors as well, but these are some of the things that we know already uh, are a problem in terms of um, uh, healthy workplaces. And what we also know from this literature is that those conditions actually pose a danger to the worker's health, to the worker's productivity. So it's uh, both health and, uh, you know, uh, producing things that actually make a difference in terms of, uh, you know, the economy and the society. So what are some of the dangers, the things that we know about? Well, people get sick, they can't work, uh, they're absent from work, the health care costs go up. Uh, there is good evidence that shows that this lowers people's life expectancy, losing working years. There's a greater risk of things like burnout, of depression, uh, and there are more, both physical and mental health that can interfere with uh, people's lives uh, and take them uh, out, of, out of the workplace. So in a sense, this is not a new issue, although there are new dimensions to it now as a result of um, uh, the pandemic. So the con to fix the job and not just the person. Um, Usually what happens is when there's a crisis in the workplace, uh, the, the thing is we've got to then help people cope with those stressors. Um, how do we make them relax? How do we, we tell them to get more sleep, be healthy, you know, eat the right things, meditate, etc. But what have we learned from burnout research is that there's something else you need to do. It's not just helping the people cope with the stressors you need to help the workplace modify those stressors. How do we change it so that people aren't having to deal with all of this extra demands? Um, some people have been saying, oh no, we're in a pandemic crisis, we can't change, we have to stick with what we know, but we're already getting disrupted. There's lots of changes that have to go on now. 
So this is really actually providing a new opportunity uh, to, as we say, uh, think out of the box, uh, try to experiment, try to come up with new ideas. What are other ways that we could structure the work, that we could divide, that we could support each other, that we could do it differently, that would modify some of those stressors uh, that we're trying to cope with? So I'm not saying it's not a good idea to help employees cope. I'm just saying there's another half, at least, of the problem that needs to be looked at. It would, what is causing the problem that they are trying to cope with? So, um, job person mismatch. Here's another lesson of what we've learned from burnout. And that is that it's not just about who the person is and what he or she brings to the workplace. It's also the extent to which there is a good fit or a match with the job, with what you're doing. Uh, and so you really need to be looking at both of those. And what we have found so far, uh, at least six areas in which there can be a potential mismatch or misfit that is predictive of burnout. So let me just share some those with you. Um, the one that everybody thinks of most of the time is demand overload. There is too much to do, not enough time to do it, not enough resources in order to meet all the things you have to do. Um, and this is probably the best predictor of the exhaustion component uh, of burnout. But often people stop right there and think that's just it. All we have to do is deal with uh, overload. And actually there's more. Second area has to do with a lack of control. And this means uh, you don't have much say, much choice, much discretion to say, we should do it a little differently, or how about I, I change it in this way. Uh, flexibility in terms of how you do the job when it's appropriate. Insufficient reward. In other words, this is about positive feedback. And do you get uh, appropriate recognition and reward for what you do when you do a good job? Um, and what we're finding is it's not so much about reward in the sense of salary or benefits. What is often in, more important is the social and psychological recognition, praise, pat on the back, wow, that was really great, thank you for helping out, whatever that happens to be. A fourth area where there's a mismatch is what we talk about as a breakdown of community, and we mean by that the workplace community the other people that you work with, work for. Uh, so it's your colleagues, your boss, your you know, uh, other staff, uh, people and so forth. This is where social support, where figuring out how to resolve uh, differences, uh, teamwork, et cetera, comes in. If people feel they cannot trust people, there's no support for their work, they're afraid of uh, what might you know, be happening and losing their job, then you don't have this really important thing of uh, a kind of a social network that really supports you. A fifth area that has come up <clears throat> is what we call an absence of fairness. And that means that whatever the rules are, the policies, the guidelines, that they are not actually followed and uh, well and done fairly. So it depends on you know, uh, who you know as opposed to what you do. Uh, this is where discrimination, uh, unfair, you know, hiring or promotion processes live. Uh, and this lack of fairness that the world isn't, you know, your work world isn't working well, uh, certainly is part of a big part of predicting the cynicism, the negative reaction that people have with burnout. Sixth area has to do with conflicts in values. This is about meaning. This is about feeling that what you're doing is worthwhile. It's making a difference. It's helping out. You're doing things you believe are important um, uh, in line with your personal values. When you have conflicts, it means that you're often not doing the right thing. You're doing the thing that somebody else is insisting on, even though it, it's um, you know perhaps unethical or perhaps not right, and people feeling caught in these kinds of uh, value dilemmas. And basically, the research shows that the more of these mismatches, the more extreme, um, 
these mismatches are, the higher the rates of burnout. So these six areas um, are giving us a clue. I mean, we know which ones are now predicting burnout. How can we turn that around in a different way? So let me just show you from uh, some of our research data how those six areas might be uh, reflected by people who are in different stages of engagement or burnout. So um, on the, the far left, you can see people who are not showing signs of burnout. They're not exhausted. They're not showing cynicism. They're not they're feeling good about the work that they're doing. So they're, they're doing well. Um, and all of those six areas, actually there's seven here because they asked us to include questions on administration. So we have those as well. But, uh, but basically they're uh, looking better than the average baseline. Uh, so these things, these other areas, there's a reasonably good fit, you know, uh, for them. Um, and in general, we find that about maybe 30% or more or less of the workforce will show up in this engaged area. If we now look at the far right, that's the burned out group, and that's where they are showing all three components that we define as burnout. Um, and they, the high exhaustion, the high cynicism, uh, the lack of a sense of efficacy and accomplishment, and they're looking much, much worse on all of these areas than anybody uh, else in this workplace sample. Um, and we used to see this, the burned out group high on all three dimensions uh, around, it used to be decades ago, maybe seven to 10% uh, of the population. It's now jumping up to like in this sample about 15%, so about you know half the number of the engaged. But there are three other profiles uh, where people are high on one dimension, but not on the others. That's, those are not burnout, but maybe they're on the way towards it or they're way back. So if you look at the three in the middle, starting from the left, the first one near engaged, um, these are the ones who are showing a lack of professional efficacy. They're not feeling good about what they're accomplishing, you know, et cetera. Uh, they're, they don't have a problem with workload, but everything else, particularly social reward community, is not looking so good. Um, if you look at the next group, which is the overextended in the middle, these are the people who are showing exhaustion only. Uh, and for some uh, people out there, people define it burnout only as exhaustion. Well, no. If you look at this, they have a huge issue. It's workload. Um, but everything else is eh, about average, typical, maybe not so bad, uh, a little bit on control there. But they do not look like the burned out group on the far right. So keep in mind that that difference is exhaustion only. It's a real clear thing, the workload. But if you look at the group that is high on the cynicism, um, the distancing, the, uh, you know, take this job and shove it, you know, who cares about what's happening with my clients, et cetera. That's the disengaged group. They're only high on cynicism, no exhaustion. Uh, they don't have a problem with workload, um, but they are beginning to show the rest of the burnout profile. So in some ways, it may be that the cynicism dimension of burnout is really the most critical one and not just, I'm too tired, I'm exhausted, uh, et cetera. So um, with this kind of data, what this suggests, among other things, is that strategies to help people cope with all of this might be different depending on where people are uh, in this thing. Uh, you know, so one size fits all, if this is your entire workforce, is the wrong strategy. Uh, something that might target the workload issue for those in overextended would be different and not really appropriate for those who are, you know, in a sense, looking more like engaged, the ineffective group, but could be better uh, and, and so forth. And uh, what you would do for burned out, what I think would be, be quite different. So this is just to give you a, a better understanding of um, how that fit between uh, person and job is really critical in terms of what we've learned from burnout. So basically what uh, I would say is, is has been a, a primary strategy generally when we talk about fit is that you fit the people to the job. Uh, and again, this is nothing this is nothing new. 
We do it all the time. We train people. We educate them. We, we make sure they learn the skills they need, you know, before they can do the job. They get practical experience learning how to do the work. Uh, and this is essentially, here's the job, here's a person doesn't know how to do it, and we do a lot of things to help them get there. We also then do a lot to try and help people cope with the stressors. So, okay, you're doing the job, but it's too much, you're working too uh, hard, you're feeling bad about it, bad about yourself, what can you do? Lots of them have to do with how do you get healthier, stronger, more resilient, uh, and this can be all kinds of things from rest, taking better care of your health, exercising, getting more sleep at night, but also things that help you relax, um, uh, meditate, uh, take naps, all sorts of other things. How do, you, how do you get stronger? The other major coping strategy is don't work. Get away from the job, uh, which sort of begs the question, what is wrong with the job that our best coping strategy is to Get away from it. Take a vacation. Don't go into work. Call in sick. Um, you know, do some sort of other kinds of uh, things. All of these are well and good, but these solutions, which are usually put on the backs of individuals, do not make the job less stressful. They don't actually change what is causing some of the problem here. It's telling. It's trying to help you do better cope better, get stronger, et cetera. And that can go so far and help, but it doesn't actually change the source of all of this, which is the stressors on the job. So let's turn that around and let's say, well, maybe we need to fit the job to people rather than the reverse. Maybe there's another way to, to approach this. And again, to some extent, we already do that. This is not, again, a new thing. Um, but it's about how do you modify the conditions of the job that end up creating negative outcomes or potential ones. And there is a model already out there called ergonomics. And basically, it's focusing on the relationship between a person and their physical environment. So we redesign the physical environment with the human being, the human body in mind. Uh, how do we redesign computer workstations so that it doesn't cause carpal tunnel syndrome? How do we redesign chairs or any kind of thing where you need to sit uh, to better support the body? How do you redesign um, the you know, control panel in the, in, the air, in the airplane, the cockpit, so that people don't run the risk of hitting the wrong button or pulling the wrong lever? How do you make it better so that there's fewer errors, fewer mistakes, people um, are, are physically supported? So we do that already uh, in many places. And basically, I think what we're, we're, we're talking about now is from what we've learned from burnout is let's use that kind of design model for social and psychological environment. How can we better design the job to support people, um, you know, what, what motivates them? What makes them tick, as we say? What, uh, what makes them excited or innovative or willing to try some new things? What, you know, makes them uh, enjoy the work and, and be there and be committed and, and so forth? So how can we use that same kind of model, not just for physical, but for the more social, psychological environment? And so what we've been uh, finding out is that when you start thinking about fit in that way, in terms of social and psychological needs, uh, it's important to realize what are the core psychological needs that keep people going and uh, motivate them and make them satisfied uh, with what they are doing and willing to do, you know, be better and more, all of the, those kind of things. And there's um, several. One is what we call autonomy. And this is a sense of having some say, some choice, some control over what it is you do, being able to use your skills in appropriate ways uh, that you um, uh, can do this. And this is one of the, the key ones that, you know, people want to have that sense of autonomy uh, 
you know, when possible with their work. A second need, a core one, is belongingness, feeling like you are part of a larger team or group or, you know, you are part of this company and part of uh, this organization. Um, I'm, I'm a teacher. I am, you know, a therapist. I'm a physician. I'm all these kind of things and feeling that I am recognized. I'm a part of it. I contribute to that, that larger uh, community. The third need is one of competence, feeling like I, yes, I feel like I know what I'm doing. I know where to go if I have questions. Uh, I can, I am actually doing a good job uh, and I'm, a, I'm aware of it. I know what to do to, to make that. These three core needs, autonomy, belongingness, competence, um, are often nicknamed the ABC needs uh, in English. Um, and uh, often people are saying if, if you can do things to make people feel that they have a greater sense of competence, belongingness and autonomy, that this, this will make a huge difference in their ability to function and do well and be healthy. But actually we're finding that there is more than those three. Those are really important, but there's other ones as well. One is psychological safety. Uh, and what this really means is that you feel that you, you are working in a safe environment where you're not going to be uh, bullied. You are not going to be discriminated against where it, you feel that you can raise questions or point out, you know, maybe there's a problem here that we could do something better. Um, that there's not a, a kind of fear of saying no uh, when you're asked to do overtime or, uh, you know, because you've got something else important going on in your life. So the psychological safety is there's now a lot of research which is really showing that this is a core thing. Uh, and I, I think now, certainly in COVID, we're seeing more and more of that issue. Fairness. Um, we've already talked about it as one of those six fit areas, but um, people really want to feel like they're, whatever the system is in their school, in their work, in whatever, that it's being fairly done, that, that people all have a good shot at whatever it happens to be and they're not being uh, prevented from, uh, from that unfairly. Meaning, again, the values that we talked about, you know, being able to say no matter what it is that I do, uh, the kind of work that I contribute, that there's something important and worthwhile and I feel proud of it. I would, you know, uh, when I see people say, I don't tell people what I do because it's embarrassing, I'm not proud of what I have to do, something is wrong here that uh, you're in that, that kind of situation. And then finally, and some people would say this is not a need maybe, but I, I think it's a really important one. We're seeing and finding that people want to have positive moments in their life, to be able to experience positive emotions, to celebrate something that really went well to laugh and, and have, you know, send, you know, humor about something that's going on, um, being recognized, doing something for somebody else that really makes you feel good. So how you build in opportunities for not an, just an absence of negative, but an actual creation of opportunities for these positive feelings. So these are the core psychological needs that make a difference to people. And there's, what it means is there's many different ways to think about any or all of these. You don't have to have every single one of these seven, but you know, how do we, how do we address where there are some problems with this by looking at, this is the, these are the things that mean a lot to people in their life, not just at work, but in all aspects of life. So basically uh, what we are learning from the burnout work is that if you flip those six areas um, and look at, the positive end of it rather than the negative, you end up with essentially at least six paths to a healthier workplace. And so this is something to now take into consideration. So for example, um, there are different ways maybe of talking about these six, but here's my uh, words that I'm using. Instead of a demand overload, too many demands, not enough resources, we have a sustainable workload. How do we redesign the workload and the people who share or not, or do it independently, so that it's sustainable? You can do it all. You can, you can manage to get it done. You can recover 
uh, and rest up afterwards and come back to it. Uh, so there are many, many ways to think about how, how can we redesign the workload, uh, how the work gets done. Uh, what are the things that are maybe nice to have but not essential? How do we cut out all of the too much administrative you know, work and you let people actually um, do the, the core work? So in terms of, for example, healthcare, actually working with patients rather than doing all the electronic record keeping. Um, so there's, you know, what are the changes we can do there? How do we build in more opportunities for some flexible choice and, and control of the work? Rather than telling people you have to do it this way, that's the only way you can do it, actually allowing for ways in which I don't have to spend so much time with this patient, but I could really need some extra time with the second one, rather than every patient, you cannot go over 10 minutes with them. Um, so uh, again, working with people to figure out what are the appropriate areas where this can, um, this flexibility can be built into their work. Third area, as I mentioned before, recognition uh, and reward. And uh, as I said, the recognition, the social recognition uh, really is important for that, that sense of I've done well, um, I, you know, the, the competence, the being uh, belonging, other people see that I can do a good job and, and let me know about it. Um, how do we redesign what, what gets done there? In many workplaces, what we would be finding is that there might be a reward system, which is like giving people gold stars or something, but it really didn't mean much. This is not um, the appropriate way of thinking about it. Uh, a supportive work community in recent decades, we have found that this is one of the most important problem areas and therefore where you really need to work. How do we figure out better ways to work together? How do we collaborate? How do we support each other? How do we, when we disagree, how do we figure out how to get to agreement and better things? Uh, how do we make the system more fair? It clearly shows respect for people um, and they feel they're, they're being treated right, even if they're not getting everything they wish they had. Um, but that they, there's a fair system, you can trust it, you can count on it. And what are the clear values, the meaningful work? Uh, what are the things that, you know, why are we here? What are we doing? How do we celebrate that? How do we underscore, uh, you know, uh, all of this? So it doesn't mean you have to do all six. Uh, what we often find in organizations is that there may be one or two areas that are working really well and there are others that are not. And you pick a place to begin. Um, and uh, so people often think, oh, it's workload, it's salary, uh, it's hours. Um, but when you frame it this way, you actually get started in some other things that are, that are more productive and, and good to do. So in terms of working within different, you know, schools, hospitals, um, you know, uh, work organizations, et cetera, there's a couple of, to do these changes, several helpful points that we have found uh, to keep in mind. One is you've got to talk to the people, the employees about what to do. Do not come in with a, uh, from the top, we are going to do X. Because if you don't get their feedback and buy-in, X is not going to happen and it won't go well. Um, often, often we are seeing people who are saying, I'm working, I'm doing this engineering job over here, but they make changes and they never actually ask us whether this is a good idea. You know, it, and sometimes it might be, but a lot of times it's like, it's more work. It's actually ineffective. It's, um, you know, generating numbers, but not actually doing better work. So the collaboration to get the feedback, to get the buy-in, um, to really reach out and, and hear from the people who are doing the work, come up with, what, five, 10 suggestions of what kinds of things would make a difference, what would be a little bit better to do, uh, and, and, and make sure that there's sort of everybody's on the same page with that. Second one is to customize, and that means adapt whatever it is to the local environment. Um, the particular occupational group, the particular culture. Uh, people are always asking me, for example, just tell me what is the best practice, the best thing to do to treat burnout, uh, and we'll do that. And the truth is, one size of best practice doesn't fit all. You know, to say, 
have better recognition of people doing good work, there are many ways to do that. What would make sense in this particular uh, organization with these people? Again, you do the collaboration. But um, there is no one size fits all best practice. Uh, it really does have to be adapted. And third, commit. Uh, and that is to sustain the effort to achieve positive gains. And you keep, you know, you try it out, you evaluate it, you modify it, you find out what some of the problems are and change it. Too often we see, oh, it's not working as well as we thought, let's stop. When in fact, it's just that you still need to get it right. It's on the, in, the, in the right direction. So going back and forth with collaborating, customizing, and, and, and commit to this are, are things to keep in mind when you're going to get people to do things a little differently that will actually help all of us um, be less stressed, and less at risk for burnout. So um, to conclude on all of this, what we've learned from burnout research on those six areas of job person fit is that there are many, many possibilities within all of those areas to improve good fit. There is no one answer, no one solution, um, but there's a lot of possibilities and that's the good news. Uh, you really you know, have to work around to see what you can, you can do. Furthermore, people all say, oh, how can we change it? I mean, how can we go change healthcare for the 21st century? It's going to be you know, so much money, so much, what is going to be hard, whatever. Actually, these kinds of changes uh, can sometimes be very small, inexpensive, and customizable. You give a little bit more control to the uh, employees, work with them collaboratively, and begin to do things a little bit differently. Um, in, in some of the, the literature that's been written about healthcare, for example, they talk about how do you fix the problem of having pebbles in your shoes, as opposed to moving the big rocks, the big boulders. Those pebbles are the chronic stressors, everyday little stuff that drives you a little nuts, adds to your, your burnout. Those are the kinds of things that, you know, start with one of those. Once you do that, try another one and so forth. Um, what we're finding with burnout as a reminder that, um, uh, you know, in, in, in line with the, the WHO definition, that burnout is a response to chronic everyday stressors in the workplace. This means the everyday stuff, not the big crises or whatever. Uh, and these are where you can begin to say, you know, we could do this a little differently. How can we make it, how can we make it better? Um, and so, I don't know why that went, but anyway, finally. So if we do that, then we're working towards creating a healthier job environment. And that's really uh, the goal that we've had in the past with the new COVID challenges. It's becoming even more critical. And I think, I'm hoping that one of the, hate to say it, but a, a, a positive opportunity uh, from the COVID uh, pandemic is that this is pro providing more of a focus on why a healthy job environment is so important to actually move forward. Uh, and that we really, it's not an extra, it's not just something, you know, nice to have or whatever. It's actually essential and we need to work on it. So if we can work on those six areas in terms of um, the social psychological environment, as well as the physical things we now know, um, that healthy work environment takes care of the workers, takes care of the workplace. So the former are going to do well and the latter will actually be successful. So I'm hoping that um, these kind of lessons that we've learned uh, from working on burnout all these decades uh, actually provides us with a bunch of guidance as where we might start and what we might do in the many ways, not just one, many ways in which we could actually create better, healthier job environments for, for everybody. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm hoping this is helpful and uh, maybe we can turn to some comments or questions. Thank you again. Thank you, Christina. Uh, we have some questions uh, from our audience, which I'll just, it's Inkeberg has uh, translated into English for you, Christina. Okay. Uh, there, were, there were 
like uh, uh, many questions, but they were like, so I'll put, I'll, uh, now it's going to be fascinating because I'm going to go into my uh, post and put them up on screen. So now you'll just see me looking really serious doing something in the computer <laughs> for a while. Okay. Uh, that's quite, quite entertaining. <laughs> but it's been an excellent, uh, excellent two couple of, uh, now I'm trying to talk and do things together. So at the same time, which <laughs> really working for me. So I'll just go all mute and yeah. see. What I was trying to show that the presentation that Linda Bauer and you two made, they were both quite uh, informative. Uh, so now I'll try to put up the questions. See. And I'm number the, numbering them one or two. So. Christina? Yes. Is there a bird song behind you? I'm sorry? Do you hear the bird uh, behind you? We, we are hearing some birds singing. I was oh, wondering yeah. if, yes. if you're hearing bird from California. It's quite <laughs> nice. It's quite nice. Um, yeah. I, I live on the side of a hill in a little neighborhood with lots of trees and flowers and stuff. But during the shutdown and the sheltering in place, the animals, the birds are coming back into the city and we're hearing a lot more birds than we did yeah. before. We're also seeing other animals like coyotes wandering <laughs> the streets. So uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. They're feeling more comfortable, I think. Okay, nice. We can hear awesome. it all the way to Iceland. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's quite nice. Uh, can you see the questions that are put, put on the screen? Yeah. Yeah, so it's they're both for you, Christina. So. There's okay. first this one. How can we develop resilience at the workplace to prevent burnout? Yeah. Well, again, um, I, I think I just want to make it clear how or, or just understand how the word resilience is being used here because it's often meaning how do we make individual people more resilient, more strong. And those would be things that are saying we're going to build in um, – a better system of breaks from work. We're going to have uh, opportunities for people to rest or to get out of the office and exercise or, you know, uh, do these kinds of things. And that's a little different than saying, uh, is it possible to think of the, the shared environment that we have uh, in terms of resilience, not just as individuals, but uh, as a team, as the staff, as the, you know, the group uh, here. Um, and, uh, you know, which may be other strategies in terms of how do we design this so that we're working together more effectively, it's putting less strain on us and so forth. So it can be either one, but it tends to be just the individual one. Um, and I guess the, the argument is, and I don't know that there's enough research on this to, longitudinal, which you would need, that if you develop strategies for, um, you know, helping people rest and exercise and be more healthy and whatever, would that prevent burnout from happening in the future? Often these things get developed after people are saying, we have a problem. And so it's almost, you know, how do we cope with it now? Um, but I really believe in terms of this question that prevention is the way to go. And the more we can do that helps people uh, cope better and, and be stronger but also looks at the workplace to how can we make it a better place for people to do their job. Uh, we really need to do both uh, and not just one or the other. So, um, uh, so that question I think can, can be looked at in several ways in terms of what the resilience is. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's often, it's often defined in terms of individuals. So for example, let me just give you, I, I don't know if, you have a similar kind of saying in, a, in Icelandic, but in English, you can hear the thing of, if you can't take the heat, 
stay out of the kitchen. And, you know, it's kind of like if you're not strong enough, if you're not resilient enough, you're not really good to do this job. So don't come or leave or, you know, whatever. Don't, don't do this. And basically we're saying, okay, but how about that heat in the kitchen? Isn't there some way to make it that it's not too hot? that is actually a more comfortable environment for people to work in rather than saying it is what it is and you just have to deal with it. Um, so uh, the thing of improving, of preventing burnout is to how do we get a better condition in the kitchen as well and turn down the heat a bit as well as how do we uh, train and help people actually do their job well and, and cope successfully. Thank you, Christina. Uh, and there's a second question, uh, which is a longer one. Uh, yeah. we, we got like two or three that were similarly sounding, so they were amalgated into this, yeah. this long one here. Uh, yeah. uh, if you can read it on the screen, I, uh, yeah. should I read it up loud or? No, I, I can see it, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a really good, I mean, these are great questions, and this one is a really good one, and I think uh, is becoming more of an issue now during the pandemic when uh, people are often uh, working at home or, or sheltering in place, you know, uh, at home uh, and may not have the same kind of support in uh, attending to people who are sick or need outside help because you can't bring in, you know, other people. So I think this is more of an issue. So yes, uh, has burnout been researched in connection with people attending to sick family members such as Alzheimer's, et cetera. Yes, there has been work in the past to look at it. And in fact, um, I, I worked with uh, one of my graduate students uh, several decades ago uh, when we were seeing this problem with regard to um, caregivers of AIDS, people who had AIDS. Um, and so it might be a family member, it might be a loved one or whatever. And again, double workload, triple workload, uh, trying to take care of all of this. Uh, and so, and you know, and what is, how is it different from a professional caregiver who was taking care of the patient as opposed to it's a family member? Um, you know, you have a different kind of relationship. There's pluses to it, also minuses, but um, uh, yeah. I, I think this is, is something that we really need to pay more attention to now because of that. So there has been prior work, um, and I, I think it's, uh, there's also been work where people are talking about uh, parental burnout um, uh, with children um, who might have disabilities and have other kinds of problems that you need to work with. Um, and basically, it says, how would you approach that type of situation according to all of this? Um, basically, this is a situation where you need more resources to help you deal with that problem. And to the extent that resources of other people, uh, of other family, of other neighbors, of other uh, professional caregivers who can come to the home and help um, has been curtailed uh, during the pandemic. Um, it, you know, we really have to think of what are other kinds of ways in which we can broaden that kind of social a community of uh, resources to help with this because just it, it, it's not a, it's not a system that really is just you know our, our how can I say this it's not just health care but it's all kinds of other care um, of, of a loved one um, and certainly in the United States we do not have a good system for helping people under normal circumstances with this um, and, uh, you know, people are all saying we don't have the money, we can't hire, we can't put somebody somewhere else, we have the medication, the, you know, whatever. Um, so it's more and more, I think, um, a flaw or a failing, a hole in our basic healthcare, social care system uh, that, that we have not been doing well in the past. And, uh, uh, but, we, but we really need to say it's not just an individual problem too bad your parent, your, you know, spouse, whatever is sick, you're just going to have to take care of it. Uh, I think we have to realize as a society, we need to help people do this because they have to work, they have to bring an income, they have to take care of the home, they have, you know, and you need assistance. Um, 
it really, you know, that whole thing about it takes a village. This is an example, I think, where it really takes a village, not just an individual person to do this. And um, so that means, you know, really rethinking that whole system and how can we bring more resources to help people and not just put all the demand on them. They can't do it. Hello. Thank you, Christina. Uh, that was the questions that we uh, got through email from our audiences. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so this uh, has been a really great uh, web conference with yeah. Linda Bora and Christina. Again, a thank you. And I just uh, reiterate that uh, we're going to meet again in Iceland after a year, uh, next year, uh, and have a regular web, regular conference. Uh, because this, uh, the subject of burnout and uh, the changes in so society and so on would still be uh, a burning issue uh, after a year, so it won't go. So It won't go away. And, yeah. and I think, uh, I, I just want to say that I think that we really have to be thinking of it more broadly uh, in terms of how we make changes. Not, you know, at the individual level, at the organizational level um, of you know where people work, and at the societal level, um, mm -hmm. I think that last question was really touching mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the person. It's not just about the workplace providing you know or or whatever. It's we as a as a larger society. How are we going to help a lot of people? You know who are going to be facing these kinds of of situations. It's not a good system now. And we need to, so it's, it's, you know, it's multiple kind of things. And that would be a message I would really want to get out that mm -hmm. uh, I think too often, my experience has been too often, we just focus on the individual and figure out that's enough. And it's fine to have the individual do something, but it's not enough in that question about being a caregiver for, you know, like a spouse with Alzheimer's is a great example of, no, it's not enough for the individual mm -hmm. alone to handle that. Mm -hmm. They can't mm -hmm. um, for all kinds of reasons, and we need to come up with something better. And that goes beyond the workplace. That goes beyond, you know, uh, it, it really goes to a larger issue. So it's multiple uh, multiple paths, multiple prongs in which we need to think about this as a problem. Mm -hmm. And And... Next year, then, always talking about next year, then we'll have the depth of time to see what progress, let's hope it'll be progress that we okay. made then and how we can evaluate and see what steps uh, society as a whole and, and yeah. have been taken just to deal with the pandemic and the effects and, of course, burnout as an as a issue yeah. in modern society. Yeah. I think also one of the things that is, is uh, really important is to have a better way of coming up with ideas and for solutions, some trial projects or whatever it is, and to be able to share that information. If there is one question that I get all the time, and quite frankly, I don't have great answers for it, is please help, what should we do? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I think it's the cartoon, you know, that you had in your, you know, the, the prior talk. So it's, you know, with Charlie Brown, what can we do? You know, and the thing is that, and I keep asking people, I say, tell me, I will broadcast it in any way I can uh, figure out other ways in which you can share it. Uh, if I knew, oh my gosh, do X, Y, Z, no burnout, if you can do that. I'd be up on the rooftops, you know, shouting out and, 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 you know, and putting it out on social media and so forth. But I don't get to hear about it. It's, it's hard for me to know what is actually being tried and what works and what doesn't work and it could work. Um, so I think we need to really have much more of a kind of crowdsourcing. What have you tried and what have you learned from that? This, this didn't work because, but you know, if you adapted it, it might actually, you know, uh, mm -hmm might be a way to go but um you know even looking at the quote research literature it is rare to have the longitudinal kind of research it's expensive it's difficult it's hard to do to really be able to say we tried something out and look it made a difference um, so when i know about something 
here's this organization that found a, an issue with fairness, uh, and which surprised them, but you know, people thought very unfair practices. They spent a year changing those things. And then the following year, the year after that, people were feeling much better about it. Not only because they had gotten rid of the stuff that everybody hated and replaced it with better policies and, you know, rewards for people who did a good job, but there was this hope like, well, wow, if we could change that, we could change something else. You know, how about, you know, let's go, uh, you know, and do this other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that kind of continual experimenting with what might work, what might not. But then how do we, how do we pass that on? <laughs> how do we, how does it go beyond that organization uh, to someone who can then either write about it or talk about it or, you know, or do whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's what we really, it would be helpful to have. So I look forward to catching up on what's going on next year. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm just going to add one thing because uh, I think this is, a, I mean, this conference or, or speak we are giving now is a, it's a, it's a wonderful cooperation with uh, three institutions. It's WIRC and it's Landlagner and it's Vinna Afterleder. I don't know how to say that in English. Okay. okay. <laughs> and I think I can say for all of these institutions that, or these organizations that they are really, um, they hope that this will be the start of a further development, a further uh, process mm -hmm. in the yeah. field of burnout here in Iceland. Uh, so hopefully when you come back after one yeah. year, we can tell you more about what we have done um, in this year. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah. yeah wonderful. And I'll, I'll try and do the same. I mean, I'm, I'm really trying to work with a number of people now to see particularly at this time, what are some of the um, uh, attempts to come up with a better, better design, a better way of you know, having people doing work, managing that with family and all of this under these conditions. So okay. I hope we'll have stuff to share. That would be great. Yeah. What did they say in the film Casablanca? Christina, do you remember it? <laughs> That's a very nice reference. <laughs> I hope this will. Do you know? Do you remember what it was? Start of a long and beautiful friendship. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That would be great. That would be yeah. great. I would love that. Absolutely. So. Fit, what anyway. if fitting last words? So. The last words. Um, yeah. No, I said these were the uh, very fitting last words. Is it could, could be a uh, 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 start of a. Good relationship oh, and uh, good church. friendship. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. really that kind of collaboration and that kind of sharing, because yeah. quite honestly, we keep saying with the COVID thing, you know, we're all in this together, um, but we really have to do a better job of when we're all in this to actually yeah. work together and share with each other those little nuggets of, of wisdom. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so when I come up with, things that people have said, we tried this and this is what is working and helping. I just feel wonderful because then I can pass that on to other people and then they can try it. And it's kind of like, what are many ways we can do that so that we're actually um, assisting, not just us personally, our organization or, you know, whatever, but um, how are we making a difference now for, for lots of others that we, we've got some knowledge to share and, uh, that would really be helpful. So that kind of connection in this time of social distancing or physical distancing, but having uh, better ways in which we can um, pass on the good things that we learn. So mm -hmm. let's do it more. And I look forward to being in Iceland and actually learning from you next year. So um, as we say, fingers crossed that this will all work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and we'll have, and we'll have, uh, better ideas about where, how to actually move forward. So, mm -hmm. greater engagement, less burnout. Really yeah. like thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda Baura, and, and thank you, Christina. Uh, thanks also the technicians at the uh, Vinnu Afterlite, which is the uh, Director of Occupational Health and Safety, I think, in, in uh, Icelandic, which is one of our, uh, one of the institutions that we're working with. And the other one is the director of health, the Surgeon General of Iceland. Okay. So, uh, 
So until next year in Iceland. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thanks for an excellent web conference and, uh, and goodbye all. <laughs>